Now that we're all on the set. Okay, so yeah, I'm so sorry for uh, being late twenty minutes. We had a lot of technical issues, and one of the students failed us today. Thank you so much, Melanie. I'll put that in the acknowledgement. Thank you for saving the session. Um, hey, hey. Um, we have, uh, someone Behave there, yourself. Well. So, yeah, welcome everyone to this closing talk. Uh, we're having in person with just MA Innovation Management students, and uh, the talk is actually happening online as well on YouTube. So it is a great pleasure to meet. welcome our panelists who will be talking about a new way in art. So we're having today with us Nicole, founder of uh, Vertical Fit for Art. Uh, we have Anna and Deja, uh, operator, um, winner of last year's Lumen Prize. We have Kenny Schachter, and again, the um, state of artist, writer, lecturer, curator. That will do. At all the institutions that we can dream of, um, like Yale's uh, School of Art, Artnet, New York uh, Magazine, and we have also Benji, Private Sales, uh, and Digital Arts at uh, Philips Auction House. So, welcome uh, to this panel. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure for us to have you here. Uh, so yeah, let's let's start. Uh, so we had this session over the last month with uh, a lot of panelists, and it was great to, to host and highlight this overview from Genart Art as well, uh, but also from auction houses um, or even for the lot of from uh, various art uh, ledgers, so like more techie. So it's kind of was like I felt something more blockchain 101 and it's one of kind of like very basic. I remember uh, more asked you guys once like how many of you know it's like three. And there was no one. So I think that this is kind of like an introductory uh, series of talks when we're trying to introduce the topic to CSM, which surprisingly is not really aware of the space. And I think uh, MA Innovation Management um, should be speaking about it, should be talking about it and be aware. Some of our students will be doing NFTs for the degree show this year. So next week, if you're in London, you can drop by CSM and it's your GTP degree open AI stuff. It's quite crazy. Um, but yeah, today I wanted to speak about curation of art um, and the changes that we've seen over the last few months uh, and actually years, but the big kind of uh, six months ago. Uh, let's start with the first question. What got you into NFT? Maybe, maybe we call it in the, the question is what got me into NFTs? Okay. Um, so actually, I got into NFTs through art. Uh, so it came through a friend of mine. So I, I, I've lived in London, although I'm not there now. And yeah, it's funny. But I, anyways, um, uh, I've lived in London for almost 10 years and kind of always uh, been, you know, surrounded with more of like the underground like art uh, culture of London. And so a lot of friends uh, that I, you know, go out with uh, are actually like artists. They they never really made it as artists, but that's their passion. And so uh, for one of these friends, actually, uh, he, he discovered Super Rare uh, quite early on, like around 2019. And um, yeah, he, he was just talking to me about this, this like platform and crypto and NFTs. And uh, honestly, I didn't really get it or I wasn't even interested up until the start of like 2020, pretty much when the pandemic happened, um, where I think a lot of people had more time on their hands also to like look into different things, be online and, um, you know, try try out different things. And so uh, that's kind of like how how it all started. So it really uh, it really was not uh, finance driven for me specifically um it was very much like art focus so I kind of started looking into super rare I started looking into rareable and opened the twitter account obviously bought my first crypto uh ETH and bitcoin and uh yeah like from there I I really uh I was yeah I liked what what I saw it was very underground like people were sharing art just because they wanted to share art um it was uh revolutionary in many ways and um yeah that's that's kind of like how i got into the rabbit hole i know that you guys have never sold an art before right 
that is no longer true. I know. As, yeah, as, as of, of this year. Why did it change? May. NFTs. The first one we had actually it It wasn't spontaneous. It was quite strategic and took a. I should say strategic in it was intentional, mm -hmm. not strategic. There was some strategy. There has to be when you're selling things, but intentional. So Anya and I have a collaborative practice and technology is a core aspect of it. And so we were adjacent to and within the adjacent to the crypto art scene and within the digital art scene as well, even though ours were kind of uh, an outsider even to the digital art scene because all of our digital art doesn't look digital. Um, and our first um, our first interaction was the crypto and digital art fair in early 2019. Uh, crypto punks were in the basement for 400 bucks, you know, this kind of thing. Um, I think Jason Bailey was there talking, Kevin Mokta, Bosch. Kevin Abosh. And this, we were kind of, we weren't crypto artists, um, but we were kind of surrounded by them. And so this, this scene was also very, um, I would say, receptive to ex experiential and experimental art that uses technology. So we kind of just sort of mostly fit there better than anywhere else. Uh, and slowly uh, we, we decided to um, create a NFT series. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that because I'm going yeah. a lot of detail. Just going to the point of never selling. So my background in choreography and performance art and vision, human computer interaction and immersive art. We have been making large scale installations, bringing together performance, environments, creative technology, basically things that are impossible to sell. And this is like pre super blue before even like the traditional art world was trying to figure out how experiment like experiential art could actually make money. Um, and so we were really just focused on making those types of projects. And that was our medium. We were, you know, liking it. It was feeling right and so selling was never really possible for us um, and I think when while we have a lot of terabytes of documentation of our projects and we could have taken a an image of an installation and sold it as an NFT we were very like we just said close to the space we are always feeling like we wouldn't want to sell just a kind of souvenir from something that was made to be experienced like with ground feel and sound and temperature and music like that it didn't feel right to call that our artwork so we were very when you mentioned like intentional, we were like, if we're gonna actually sell something that we're putting our name on that someone's buying as our artwork, it needs to be actually um, created to be consumed in the medium that you know someone would have it and own it and be able to like get something from it. So that's kind of why it took a long, a long time, but it feels you know right to do it right. And now we're playing with experiential NFTs, and so now it's getting fun. Well, for me, it's just art. I mean, I can't say that I came from the art world because I'm self-taught and I never studied art and the art world basically wouldn't have me, not for lack of trying. And I carved out a role for myself where none existed by writing for Artnet, curating many shows since the beginning of my career. I've been three decades in the traditional art world clawing my way to whatever opportunities I was able to create for myself. So because I never went to art school and didn't work my way up through the system, as a writer, I began embedding my articles with my own, I've been making digital work since the 90s. So I've been making animations, videos, oversized computer prints and sticking them in exhibitions I curated in these hit and run shows before the word pop-up even existed for these types of projects. and. Like I said, I just embedded my works into my articles and I never thought that I would ever be able to make a living from what I cared most about doing. When I got wind of NFTs two years ago, it immediately occurred to me that this was an unprecedented, unprecedented departure in as much as no rational systematic market ever existed to buy and sell digital works. And we live in a digital, age, everything. I mean, COVID accelerated, like you mentioned, our assimilation of technology. I had clocked 16 hours in one day of screen time on my telephone, which I was quite a personal best 
I'm quite proud of. But I mean, my whole life comes from digital, the relationships in real life that I have, my work, my writing, my, I've been teaching nonstop. And I've even, last semester I taught a class on NFTs at New York University and given dozens and dozens of lectures on the topic. And I love to, like you said, like I, there was a lot of impetus to share information and try to help each other in the early stages of this um, projects. And anyway, so when I found out about NFTs, I jumped in, started writing about it, teaching it and doing it. And since then, not a day of my life pretty much has been the same. And I'm on, I'm on a bit of a lecture tour in the next month. And this is about the third in this trip. So I just think largely what I'm interested in is facilitating opportunities for people. And, you know, with Web3, you mentioned really Web3 for me is like spreading out your shit on a blanket on a street corner and selling your stuff directly to the public. And I think I'm most interested, it's a bit of a cliche, but, you know, it's very difficult for artists to get a foothold into the system. And I'm all for people. I mean, again, this has been flogged to the point of ridiculousness about empowering artists, but there's a lot of opportunities for people like you, people like me. You're working in the digital space at, at an auction house. I mean, like I said, we live in digital days. Why would, why would paintings be selling for hundreds of millions of dollars and digital art have no market? Or Steve McQueen is one of the greatest artists of our generation or the past few generations. His auction record is $30,000, it's criminal. So I very much believe contemporary art is meant to be contemporary. It should speak socially, politically, economically, and technologically. And I'm interested in technology from a cultural perspective and helping people. It's not that bad anymore. I think I saw Dimitri, it's a million. 1.1. 1.1. 1.1 million. Right. But I mean, those big, those big numbers are irrelevant, you know, because 99.9% .9 of the artists in the digital space don't make a lot of money. But yes, since the dumb people yes. phenomenon, that opened people, I mean, the art world responds to one thing and it's money. So once the big money came around for some quasi, I mean, whatever, he's a nice enough person, some of the work could be deemed questionable. But once that big number came through, it was symbolic and it just, it was, it got the attention of the greater marketplace and ecosystem. Yeah, I know. These are just some few examples that we know, like people, Dimitri, but actually I think the stats are saying against everything. Like 75% of the whole market is like around $15. And then, you know, it's just this 1%. It depends on the marketplace, but this is just pretty easy. 1% of our, like very minimal number is higher than $1,500. So we just know like these few names. Is it actually replicating the contemporary artwork? Like, you know, you have these few artists that are being curated, promoted by these main institutions, and they are being sold by a lot of money. Or is it still empowering this emergence moment? Just... Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a double edged sword because, you know, auction houses have traditionally worked purely in the secondary market. Um, I'm from more of a primary background and artist, music art kind of management. Um, and so, yeah, before, before I kind of went into the auction house, I was very artist focused. And when I moved to it, being able to work with digital artists on a primary level um, at auction houses is a fairly new phenomena. Um, and so you have the opportunity to present your work as you want it sold at auction. Uh, you can set your own prices. You can also pick which work goes to market because you can consign brand new works. So I think it's also a different model for the traditional auction house where you have that creativity to work with the artist and decide exactly what they want to do, um, which is, you know, kind of revolutionary. Um, you know, we do, we do still do secondary stuff, uh, but as an auction house, that's kind of our bread and butter is bringing interesting and new stuff to market that can't be found anywhere else. So it's, uh, yeah. Do we need any curation? So, I mean, when we talked previously about NFTs empowering artists or removing the gatekeepers because now the artists can directly see the collectors. Yeah, uh, so let's ask the artists. Mm -hmm. um, would you prefer to have a gallery presenting you or no. would you like this direct communication? I, I would not prefer to have a gallery 
representing or you can answer differently i agree and even though we're also <laughs> we're also married and we have a collaborative art and we talk about this but lot, so we can I have agree. different opinions um however i think the role of the curator is very important and we have wonderful relationships with curators who have been part of our practice and have helped shape mm -hmm. the direction of our practice through you know, intense and critical dialogue, us being very open and sharing process for many, many years. So we have some relationships where we've been working with curators from 2019 up to the present day. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're even working on a show together, but just having a constant dialogue and sharpening the sort, it, it keeps us on our toes, toes as well as the curator. And so for me, my experience, so the positive experiences I've had with curators, I think their role is is very essential. And good yeah. for artists. But that's it's different, done. right? Yeah. Let's ask Nicole. Can I? Can I read it? Is it different? What? No, it's that's public. You can't. You can't say it and then not read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's public. That's okay. against the rules of international okay. secret. Okay. So, Nicole, can you can you share it? Um, yeah. Yeah, I have to say I I hear very little, so I'm gonna try and make sure I understand the questions. But yes, um, so I agree with what Annie and Deja have said. I mean, we have actually spoken about this uh, specifically uh, as well. Um, I don't really know if like web free takes out the gatekeepers. Like I think uh, this is a bit of one of those like misconceptions of, you know, thinking that one technological advancement will solve all the problems in the world because it won't. Um, so I think it's more about potentially opening up the gates, let's say, to more people to come in. But the gates are still there. There are still gatekeepers. And actually, if we think about uh, the major like platforms or marketplaces, if you think about Superware, for example, which is obviously one of the biggest and well-known uh, platforms, it is a gate-kept platform. You have to send an application to be able to be on it, to be able to sell on it, to have access to their collector base, their market, their visibility, et cetera. Obviously, there's a lot of a lot of open um, marketplaces as well, and that's and that's great. But again, that doesn't mean like it doesn't mean that if you do if you you know produce an NFT as an artist instantly like it'll sell. There's still like processes, people, uh, gatekeepers uh, that are needed uh, to be able to. Um, put you in front of maybe like the right people, the right audience, uh, know how to market your work, how to talk about your work, how to contextualize your work, what is the storytelling behind it, et cetera, et cetera. So the role of the, the curator, the, the, the marketplace, the auction houses, to me, it's still relevant and important. So how, how, how do we curate all this? Is it different? I mean, so like for you, when, when you're curating a show, what are the factors that we're looking at? Is just Instagram followers? I mean, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Excuse me. No, no, no. Like super, uh, Excuse me. <laughs> I beg your pardon. So what I would say just in relationship to what was just said, I mean, I would I was just thinking as we're speaking, and I think we are our own gatekeepers in a sense. And really, there are the main NFT platforms are all controlled as to who gets to participate. Nifty Gateway, Super Rare, Maker's Place, Known Origin, Foundation. There are many others, uh, Art Blocks, where you have to be curated, although many of the curators are like the CEO or some tech executive that gets stuck into the role of curating, even mm -hmm. though they've never been to a gallery in their life. Mm -hmm. So in effect, really, this is about, I do believe like that there are big changes afoot based on everything that we're talking about. Yes, there are a lot of things that are the same, but you mainly need to cultivate and nurture an audience in order to sell yourself in anything. And this is no different. So even if you're you know, enabled to go directly to market as an artist with the mechanism of NFTs, you still need to have an audience of people to buy it. I mean, I've been doing this for two years. I've been making art digital art for three decades, but 
it's a big hustle. Each and every time I sell something, I don't know when the next sale is going to come. And it's excruciatingly, painstakingly difficult. Funny enough, like not until I was able to sell my art with a couple of early successes when the market was just going up. So anything would have done well. And then a gallery wanted to work with me. I came to their attention as someone who created a reputation in the digital art space in the, via NFTs. And as this, I guess, in, as opposed to what you said, I mean, I'm thrilled to have galleries to work with because everyone brings a different audience to your project and art needs an audience to complete the equation. So existing only on an NFT platform is not enough for me. I'm interested in, well, I mean, so when I curate shows, I just curated a large group exhibition in a kind of pop-up space in New York a few months ago with 38 artists from 15 countries. It wasn't just any popular no, Instagram I I influencers. Sorry, I'm, I'm just kidding. That's okay. Controversial. Are controversial. It's kind of <laughs> okay. No, I'm just. Kidding. Apply for a speaker and then bracket. We're not looking at followers. Like, of course they are. They're looking for money is what they're looking for. Like, but in a way, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, right now that the, the traditional art world and the, and the digital crypto art world are two parallel lines that sometimes collide. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason that Phillips and Christie's and Sotheby's have become primary dealers in this space is mainly because the galleries are petrified. People, it's human nature to resist something new and mm -hmm. unknown. So people resist change. And when you don't understand something, instead of taking the time to learn or having curiosity and an open mind, it's the inclination. The art world is the most conservative field. I've been in fashion, law, floor, the stock exchange, a million different things, and nothing prepared me for how backward looking and conservative the art world is. And it's just pretty awful. So uh, they're resistant to change because they control access and seeding access to other players, whether it's OpenSea, Super Rare, or any of these platforms, they don't like it because, I mean, when I sold art, when I had a one person exhibition in Berlin, I was paid and then I in turn had to pay the gallery. And that's unprecedented in the history of the art market where typically the galleries get the money, they rarely even tell you who they're selling the art to and they pay you when they're good and well ready to, if ever sometimes. So I think that there's a lot of just new mechanisms, new systems in place that creative people are just grabbing, I mean, and, and doing with it what they want. But don't be, like you said, I mean, you know, when I curate a show of NFTs or anything, it's, it's all like what you see, going to do studio visits, looking on social media, not for how many followers someone has, but for the quality of their work. Social media was the start of this whole phenomenon because it used to be you'd have to send a little, a little photographic slide and that was the only way to convey an image from one person to another via mail. And now Instagram blurred all the geographical boundaries so people could communicate visually. So I just think like taken with the right purposes, the right intent, these are great tools at the disposal of artists that changed their practice, their lives, my practice, my life. You're working for an auction house doing primary art cultivation is never existed as something to do before. I mean, I, I, I actually did everything in Instagram uh, with Anya and Deja. It was more like a Twitter relationship and then we just met in person. Um, we met on Instagram and now we're married. <laughs> we also got our first museum commission from, from a story, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. It, is, it is kind of like a huge change, I think, like, for us. That's like, amazing. Mm. It's showing, like, it's actually, like, it's not easier, but there is, like, also, there's more opportunities, I think, to do collaborations, reach out to partners, you know, anything that we want to do. It's just, it's more doable. I mean, at the same with collectors, like, but then to think about going to solve this and buy something in my head, it's like, how do I even get into that auction house? And now I just go, like, buy an NFT on the website. It's really kind of, in a way, democratizing that. But something that caught my mm, my mind when we said, you know, about the race is that there's this tech culture. You know, a lot of engineers suddenly became artists. This culture of cover artists. I went in New York to one of the events. I don't think I should say. Say. <laughs> yes, you should. I think you should. Okay, I went to the three of studios, and. Um, it was right day before Decom, and there was a lot of collectors there, a lot of kind of people who are talking about art. And they were like, What are you doing here? It's like, It's free, it's New York. 
And like every single person look at me and have no idea what is free. And they all just thought, well, I'm just buying art, I'm buying art. But you don't know what is free. And it was shocking for me. So I'm just like, like, is the art world a bit like resistant to it? Because we can see now, like, basically a wave of all these technologists buying, collecting, and then hence curating art as well. There are lots of shops curated by you know, an OG. And, and my job always was like, if you bought a first iPod in history, can you be a music critic? Should you be a music critic? Like, are you now a judge in a Grammy or like, so it, 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 it led to this thing that a lot of people like, I bought a first NFT in 2015, hence I'm, I'm an art curator. And what do you think about this, yeah, this new way? As an artist. <laughs> I have a, a thought. Oh, I yeah. have a, a sneeze. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Collaboration. Um, so I, sh I, I really connect with what you're saying, um, but to take an opportunity to be positive in where this could go and to encourage a new direction so that tech bros aren't the curators of the world, which I agree, this is happening a lot um, and not knowing who institutions like Gropius Bow are, but they run a giant NFT gallery um, and that's concerning. Um, at the same time, I don't think we need to be elitist, but if it's not giving to the space, then I think that's an issue. But I, I go back to experiments of art and technology experiments and art and technology 1967 EAT where new art was created through technicians and engineers Cold War engineers specifically and contemporary artists of that time coming together with either party not having an idea of what it is they were going to make but the idea that they were going to work through an experiment you know to hopefully, you know, fall somewhere. Um, and I welcome that type, those two worlds coming together in that way. And I think it even can be done within um, sales and, and marketing and platforms, you know, cause that's a necessary vehicle, but I don't think that is what's happening in the example that you're giving, but I think there is room for that to happen. And I'd like to see that shift from tech bros who don't know the rich history of art or computer art even, um, and probably not even the, the technology and the rich tools that are available um, to artists. Like, of course, everyone knows processing, which is a really, you know, especially in that scene, uh, which is a really valuable tool and an incredible one. Um, but that was built off the backs of, you know, computing, our computer art for for decades so yeah that's my thought thank you you kind of let the was an opening of the gen art exhibition if you like that. yeah i how mean it, how do people receive that too? yeah so we're, we're putting on a show uh, about 50 works starting in the early 1950s with herbert franca all the way through to you know works you know so far as squiggles um and really trying to demonstrate the rich history, how it's developed, um, you know, the, how simple the tools were. And to that point, as you were saying, you know, a lot of these artists were scientists, mathematicians, um, you know, physicists that essentially loved aesthetics and got creative um, and tirelessly just practiced their craft and are now getting kind of a limelight. So I really wanted to show the evolution um, and how generative art has developed over the years. But the reaction is interesting. I mean, you have people that have been collecting these works you know, for like 20, 30 years and it's super, super tapped in. You also have new clients um, and new collectors, both from the NFT side that now want to collect physical works and also people that collect physical works, um, maybe even outside the general space and are curious about digital art because of that. Um, and so I think the reception is, people, people are excited, people are interested. And I think also it's important to always contextualize these works. Um, and whilst, you know, gatekeeping isn't great or ideal, sometimes if you don't do it or curate uh, at least in, in some way you do end up with a bunch of bros like hoarding stuff in their mega museums um and so 
I think it's also important to contextualize those works and also educate collectors. Um, if you do curate something well and you, you give context to stuff, it really shows the narrative of the works um, and overall adds value to all of it. It's quite yeah. difficult to educate or contextualize only obviously websites, right? Which is an artifact, just a sentence. It's not like you can go to the gallery, get a catalog, and like you don't have a catalog. But I mean, there's also something, also something great about OpenSea that you can just go on and everything's there. Like, you know, it's maybe not great to buy and like pick pieces and, but you also find gems and it's great that every, it's pretty democratic. Yeah, everyone's work is there. Um, I wanted to ask yeah. also about onboarding artists. So we call you, you know, our residences as well. Can you give me a little bit share a bit like how does it look like, what type of artists were like, artists artists that, Digitally already, or trying to kind of you know help them with the shift into the space. Yeah, and also I wanted to add a comment on the the new collectors because I think it's it's important. Like part of the beauty also of what we're seeing now is actually that art is becoming accessible to people who had no idea that they were collector before. So I talked to like you know, we were on auctions, like we have a lot of collectors that before two or three years ago, or even maybe like a couple of months ago, had like no idea that they could even be interested in art. And I think that's kind of a really interesting phenomenon and a beauty, like art should be accessible to all really, you know, it has to be accessible to all. So the fact that I think collectors or like tech bros don't know about freeze, um, for me, it's okay, you know, like the, 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 they like the, the process is not about not knowing it's about trying to then educate, as Benjamin was saying, like these new collectors on what is the context and the history and uh, the differences, let's say, between artists to artists and where does where does this history come from as well. So I think that's like, to me, it's very exciting uh, to have like a whole new collector base, a whole new group of people that is interested in art for some reason or the other, whether it's speculation, whether it's trading, whether it's whatever kind of brought them in, it, you know, they're here now. So I think that's, 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 that's very interesting. But yeah, on your question, um, yeah, we, we run, so last year, uh, kind of like after the people madness, basically, um, we, I, I realized that there was a lot of artists, uh, especially like let's say uh, people that were interested in web free and the space and had no idea how to work in the space, what even like the technological like side of NFTs is. So like smart contracts, you know, blockchain, what are non-fungible tokens? What does on-chain mean? Like, where does your data go? Like all of these like very nuanced aspects of the NFT space. Um, and so we launched a, uh, yeah, we started a residency program, which is a not-for-profit, so it's completely free uh, for artists to take part. And it really uh, wants to try and like uh, tap into like the education side of all of this, because there is a lot to learn about. And actually, um, a lot of people that are very knowledgeable uh, about these things, people like Jason Beatty, like Fanny Lacobay, like Bernadine Brocker, um, like Colburn Bell, like a lot of the kind of early, uh, let's say, pioneers and thought leaders of, you know, crypto art and, and blockchain art, essentially, uh, who are mentoring um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the artists that we have in, in the residency. And so the artists go through uh, eight weeks of like classes, more like workshops, really. Um, and then, yeah, then we have a, a last, a last four weeks that is basically like the creation phase of the residency and we try to um onboard we do open calls and uh there's no real like criteria but the the biggest criteria is trying to uh, make sure that like we're onboarding people from like all over the world because everything is online it means that you know you don't have to be physically in you know a house or a resident to to actually like participate so the last residency we had like 20 artists from 15 different places 15 different countries in the world and this time we have 22 from like 12, 13 different countries. So like always really like diverse and global. That's quite interesting because you said, okay, so the whole residency is online. And I'm just really curious, like in two years, how the same education, like, you know, when we're teaching online, like, and we might this term and like, you know, what would happen if like, imagine you know, guys, like your whole course would be online. Like, and comparing that to previous cohorts, which had in-person classes, 
would that you know change anything? And question back to Kenny, when you curate in this week, said you created for decades, and then you know previously I asked you when you created like physical shelves, and now you know, you're curating online shelves. What's the difference? I and mean, what do you think where is this going? Do you still like buying your real life shelves? Well, also, well, to harp back to the last question for a second, I mean. I think people should do whatever they want as long as they're not breaking the law or harming anybody. And Karl Marx even said, why can't you be a fisherman in the morning and an economist in the afternoon? And I mean, to be, it's harder to become a hairdresser than an art advisor in terms of schooling and accreditation. So, you know, the people that fancy themselves curators, it becomes diluted in terms of its meaning. I mean, I think that connoisseurship and scholarship is unfortunately on the wane and everyone is looking for a quick fix and immediate gratification. But nevertheless, I mean, I just stopped by before I came here, there's a new gallery that's opening in the next days on Dover Street and it's run by women gallerists and they're showing female NFT artists, only females for this show. And it's a beautiful space and they have a great I only just met them through another friend that I lectured to last week. And uh, it's a great initiative. So I think the traditional art world has made incredible strides over the last 10 years for creating opportunities or for having an equal footing into the art market for female artists, artists of color, artists of different orientations for whatever. And the tech world way lags behind that, but that's changing. and. It just needs a bit more time. It took the, the traditional art world centuries to get to where they are. And the tech world operates in what I call like dog years. One year in technology is 15 years in real life. Things go so fast. So that was that. And back to your question. I mean, I, unless, I mean, I make digital art, but in my home and my studio, I'm surrounded by the, my house is, wallpapered by the art of other people. I love drawings, the immediacy of a hand to a piece of paper for me is one of the most extraordinary experiences. And during the first three months of lockdown, I just rub my nose up against the piece of art every single day. And I believe that, I mean, even seeing this gallery installation today with, you know, 20 screens, a new screen technology they were employing, and um, there's nothing, I mean, as an example, I say like I bought a trash can on Amazon and when it was delivered, it was this big, it was like a thimble. You couldn't even fit more than like a piece of crumpled paper in it. Nothing will ever replace the physical experience of standing in front of an artwork. And I'm a teacher and I taught my first studio practice class, the first one I ever took and taught simultaneously like art history years before, but was on Zoom. And I almost, when no one, I would imagine no one ever heard of Zoom before COVID. And then all of a sudden, I mean, and still like Zoom is so, that technology has been around since like the seventies. We should all be having meetings in the metaverse and interacting with art and people, but nothing will ever replace looking into someone's eyes and being with people and physically communicating to someone. So. I love digital art. A lot of my work ends up in digital shows. I teach digitally. I mean, when Nicole first mentioned, like I've had lectures for a thousand people and all I could see was my own stupid face on the screen. It's a nightmare to try to communicate. So art is communication and communication doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens with people sharing experiences and that's what art is about. That's what digital art is about. I'm not interested in anything other than art and people. So. I don't really differentiate. So I think I love to curate. The last show I curated, I mentioned was large, mostly physical, but there were some screens and NFTs amidst it. I don't differentiate, art is art. Some of it comes in performative experiences and painting and sculpture and people will always collect physical art, but digital art should be on parity with that. And I think that exhibitions that a hybridized, fidgetal is a stupid ass word they came up with for this type of thing, excuse my language. And uh, that's cool. I just think the more experiences, like I would never definitively say I'm an NFT artist and galleries suck or auction houses are stupid. I mean, look, Sotheby's made this tragic error where the arrogance 
of this traditional marketplace where they tried to sell 104 crypto punks in one lot at auction and they were like the lowest valued nfts in that series and they mistakenly with the hubris and the arrogance to think that they were somehow presenting something special when anyone could go and buy them on open sea at a low price why would you pay a premium of 20 Five percent to Sotheby's for some shit that you can just buy. That's the whole point: is the directness of this experience. So they had a party, they had a dinner, they had a DJ wearing a stupid punk outfit, and then the things didn't sell because of greed. And uh, and they learned, and that's that's a good example for everybody that you know, like when the when the Asian Chinese market first open and Basel took over an existing fair in Hong Kong and all these dealers were all this crap from their back room and thought they would foist it upon you know upon this marketplace and they learned really fast that people are not to be you know given short shrift or or not to be given credit for people having brains and knowledge and information so I just think all of these things makes for much more interesting bigger pie for people to have opportunities and that's the only part of it that I care about I want to ask them how did you manage to make your quite physical you know, art experience and performance into the NFT? Yeah, so I think this is a huge question for us. Um, and I think one aspect is like a bit of an obvious easy answer, which is like being that the human body is a big part of our practice, like our first lot, which is called attempts. The human body is also the center. I also feel like everyone I know that's in Web3 is like very burnt out, like forgets to eat, forgets to drink water, forgets to go outside. We need a little bit of a reminder of that we still live in these, you know, physical vessels that have needs, regardless of how much of our life and excitement and interaction is happening online. So I think one is just like reminding us of the human body and by showing it and using it and bringing it into it. I don't, I mean, the human body is a really interesting medium because regardless of whether you're trained in movement or not, we're all living inside, you know, one of these. So like, if you see someone moving, you can kind of like have a physical sensation of knowing what that would feel like to bend your arm or to move your head. And so I think that's an aspect of physicality that just like the human body from an audience to a performer is an immediate, like very accessible way of recognizing because we share this vessel together. So that's kind of an element of physicality but we're going further into that but I also feel like in terms of introducing people to our work um not feeling like it was enough to just do this through digital services like Twitter or Discord and so when we um, were releasing our works we decided to kind of introduce people to our work through um these privacy dinners where we essentially took the entire theme of our artwork the privacy collection and we worked with a chef in different cities, local performers, and we essentially created like an entire performance installation where the food was art, there was music, performance, costume, people writing private keys, like it was like a happening around the theme of privacy, where we were also, you know, people were learning about our work and seeing the piece, but also understanding like the world that we're coming from, which is where all of these things come together into a singular experience and people who I think met us in that context and then saw our work later also had a memory associated with that work that was very special so i think um a blend of when you can being in, in space with people is really important especially for us being that that's our, our native tongue we're like come experience you know i don't know our our, our mother tongue of, of our, our practice and then they had that memory to associate later when they saw the pieces that were kind of born from that origin. For me, this dinner was like really about bonding with other people. Mm -hmm. It was just magical moment when we had this intimate, I don't know, a few hours. I actually was quite long. <laughs> but it felt like that. Yeah, it was amazing because like, it was like super dark, and then we just like had this um, kind of like quite small group of people going through like all this stuff. Performances, music. Um, it was just a great bonding moment. Yeah, I feel like it was also like we learned a lot about the work, but it kind of like also built this community that, that we are building somehow in this world. But I think it's slightly different than when yeah, you go to a private view, you go to like a dinner with a gallery, and like, you meet other people who are interested in similar type of works. Uh, so I'm very curious, like how how this yeah, how this uh, this will change the way 
and experience what we're, the way we we're purchasing those institutions. Some last comments um, because we're running over time and it's kind of our fault because of the technical issues. And I just saw on YouTube that there's still technical issues. Um, <laughs> but I'm trying to fix that later. Um, shall we move to any? I mean, I can like leave a little bit that if you have any questions about the room and then go back to the place. Yeah, I'm interested. How often do you run your your um, in person experiences along with when you are ready to sort of release an NFT? Is how often do you do that? Well, we just started releasing work in February, and so we knew that we were going to release this last lot, which was in April. And so then there were three big NFT events happening, and so we were basically like, okay, all the people kind of in that world are going to be in these cities, and so. We were guilty. We knew it was the same thing. We went to the city where this was happening and had a satellite event without going to the conference because we were busy really like producing our dinner and setting everything up. Um, and so we did three that were leading up to this first moment. But someone was saying, asking Deja, and she's like, okay, so how are you selling them? And she's just like, that's the point. There's no selling. Like, we're not selling. We're just yes. like having a beautiful time with people. And there, there is someone, there is no selling. There is no selling. And that's why it's, it's so nice. Like you said, you don't leave feeling like you're in an advertisement. We just had a really, really special experience with people and you built memories and you had good conversations and then that's associated with us and the kind of people that we want to surround ourselves with and how we're approaching art and blockchain and NFTs, which is not, I think, what people normally associate with NFT art, is that kind of experience. And you're building community yeah. and we kind of were joking that some people build community using tools like Discord, but we're not very good at that. So we have dinners instead, <laughs> um, which we I think we it's it's more it's more of a comfort zone for us. But I mean, for I, I really think um, for us, it's it's we've actually kind of built out a schedule and we are improvising at the same time, too, and not totally strict and, and forcing anything that you know is impossible or making it fluid enough that it can change as we go but at the same time um we are releasing each of the lots which we're releasing one lot at, at a time over a 12-month period and it comes to a close in december and we're aligning each lot um with a physical event somehow. And so we have different partners, um, which also, you know, create different contexts um, for the work that we're creating as well. But it's, um, I think for us, it's just easier for us to communicate with people in the flesh mm -hmm. and digitally, it's very difficult for us. Yeah. Uh, I saw uh, in they have already had an art curation, but I'm thinking about like uh, if they will be allowed to have it in the mainland of China, because the NFT transaction oh, is not allowed to um, make in the mainland of China. I was I was just in a group show that um, Justin Sun, who started CryptoTron. He just had an exhibition in Beijing. So I think, I mean, people are very resilient. So the governments can legislate for the for eternity till they're blue in the face. But the whole point of crypto is to get around this kind of centralized control. So, I mean, there's VPNs and there's a million different ways to get around the system. And I'm sure that, I mean, you have to be careful and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, the political situation in China and Russia and various jurisdictions, but I think the government will never be able to stop the impetus of, I always say like the ETH is in the ether or the genie is out of the bottle. And now that artists have seen that there could be an organized functional marketplace for digital stuff and performative stuff and all kinds of different things that didn't exist before, not even if crypto crashed, I mean, it's crashed, but if it imploded, still of from the ashes there would be some semblance of what has already ex come to into existence from nfts so whether it's china or anywhere else you know in hong kong i guess there's a different set of regulations but i just think people will get around it somehow i mean there's also the digital one in china 
The which they already have a digital coin in China. So, but I don't know if it if it works with Ethereum. No, no, it it doesn't. But I mean, there's some appetite clearly. Sure, to 100%. make stuff digital, but politically, it's. I mean, yeah. Do you have any cooperation with like uh, some of the uh, like the Chinese artists? Because I, I think like the Chinese calligraphy and the painting was quite like a uh, uh, heritage. I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of Chinese artists that are employing various, of getting their art somehow heard in 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 the crypto world. They just have to be a little bit more ingenious about it and industrious because there are regulations against it. But that never stopped. Art cannot be stopped, not by governments, not by dictatorships, fascism, communism. It can't, and it never has, and it never will. Right. <laughs> With this one, uh, we will end it. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Kate. Everyone, I'm so sorry for all the technical issues. You did this. It's, it works fantastic. You just got started. Well, if you want to stay for another six six hours, we can go. Yeah, we'll talk about it also. Nicole, so hopefully, we'll see you in London. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for coming uh, online and then you as well. So hope to see you soon in London. Uh, thank you, Anya. Thank you, Deja. Thank you, Deji, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.